1031 is yeah. when you sell a property and you put you have to give the money to someone else. You can't touch it. Put it in an escrow account. A lawyer or somebody holds it. And then uh, you can you don't get taxed on it. Yeah. You then take that money and buy a like property. So you can't sell your condo and then buy, you know, a vacation home or whatever. Yeah. Or those are the rules. I 1031 that into another two family and a single family, which I renovated and sold. I just wanted to kind of start off like early days of Marilyn. And I wanted to hear how you first got like the real estate bug. I know that there was a there was a children's poem that you've actually named your company after, which we'll get into. But I wanted to hear if you had any other influence, like influences like family members or teachers or how you maybe knew early on that real estate architecture was going to be your thing. Well, um, I didn't actually have very many influences that were direct. I didn't know anyone who was an architect. I didn't know anyone who was in real estate. All I knew is from the, my earliest, earliest memories, I just loved buildings. So what I did when I was a kid was make forts and build buildings. So I had like dolls, but I never like dressed them up and played with them in sort of the traditional way. I would just make them houses and, and that transitioned into drawing houses and I would um, sneak pieces of paper into my elementary school and draw um, portions of a city and then take them home and tape them all together and have a city like as big as my wall. I don't know where I got any of this. I just always, always wanted to draw cities and I made land plots that I would replat them and like show little like towns or like different subdivisions of like buildings and things. And then I would get uh, floor plan plan books from the grocery store and a little pot of white out and white out all the walls and redraw them where I wanted to. And it, I just didn't, I just did all this for fun. I thought it was really fun until someone said, you know, that's actually like, that's, those are jobs. Like you could have one of those as a career. And that I had never thought of that until someone mentioned it. So was that in high school that that happened, that somebody directed you towards architecture school or how did that, how did that come about? You ended up going to where, uh, University of Virginia? Virginia, yeah. Um, so uh, I remember taking uh, aptitude tests, maybe middle school or early high school, career aptitude tests, and my two top scoring careers, it was equally balanced between actress and car mechanic. So I was like, all right, well, that's cool. I hadn't really thought of either of those as a profession for me. But, uh, you know, it wasn't, um, I'm not, I didn't get the most support ever uh, in high school for it. Um, just because I think, uh, I mean, I was told flat out that girls don't go to architecture school. Um, so I found it on my own and my parents are super supportive. And then I had um, some teachers who were really supportive and, uh, when I went to visit architecture schools, I, it just sort of, I, it just sort of occurred to me. Like I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't know, know anyone who did it. So I just started researching schools and I, I was like, architecture school, this sounds like everything I've ever wanted out of school. So when I started to visit them after, I guess, you know, junior year, sophomore year, whenever you visit colleges, I would walk into these architecture studios at you know, these universities. And I was like, I'm home. Like, this is literally what I was doing when I was five years old, except you can get a degree in it and you make real buildings eventually. <laughs> so it was just, it just felt so right. And I wanted to go to UVA for many reasons, but one of them is my other degrees in history. And I really wanted to have a really robust, also additional education, not just strictly architecture. Yeah. So, so after undergrad, I understand you took a job as a general laborer and I had Eric Weatherholtz on the show a while back. And I think he did a, one of his newsletters was like his first day on the job as like, you know, in construction. And I kind of wanted to hear some stories about your, your days as a general laborer right out of college doing really hard work. But uh, I would imagine like you learned a ton in that first job. So I just kind of wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. So the, um, my whole final year of undergrad, I actually did a project with a group of students where we designed and then built a house. So we, it was a modular house. We actually built it in pieces and trucked it to the site and craned it into place. 
worked with a local uh, nonprofit developer to do that. That was my first exposure to like, what is a pro forma and why are we doing market rate affordable housing? Mm -hmm. That was my fourth year of undergrad. And then that whole summer we, we built it. And I was like, this is amazing. Like I'm building the thing I drew with this team of students and other, you know, fellow students and wow. So it's really hard to actually, uh, you draw something, you think it's going to work and then you go out there and you build it. And <laughs> turns out it's nothing like what you thought it was. And our instructors um, and our mentors, we had a general contractor was our mentor as well in helping us through this. And just let it, let us have enough rope that we could actually kind of mess up, but mm -hmm. not too much rope that obviously would mess up enough that it would be dangerous or something like that. But um, so after that experience, um, that was winding down in um, October, I guess, after my um, after I graduated and I got a job. Uh, yeah, it was basically as a laborer. So it was part laborer, part office. And the office part was um, basically uh, or shop more like they were a design build company and they had a shop. And so I would spend a lot of time like vacuuming out saws and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, my first day on the job, literal first day, the, constru the construction company that I was working for was renovating an architecture office. Mm -hmm. And I, my job was to carry rubble from the, the basement where we were jackhammering out the slab to put in these footers for these steel posts and i had to carry the rubble in these buckets five gallon from, buckets right <laughs> yeah from the basement through the architecture office like past people who i had gone to school with who were like dutifully doing what you're supposed to do after architecture school which is learning how to be an architect and i was like sweaty and gross and mm -hmm. uh pretty disillusioned on day one very hungry i did not pack enough lunch yeah and that was my first day so after that, you know, lots of other stories about that as well. Um, similar type uh, adventures. Um, you know, I, I uh, was the smallest person on the crew. Um, I was always the smallest one on the job site. I was the only woman on the job site most of the time. And it uh, turns out that being the smallest one on the crew, you'd think means you get excused from heavy work because they're like, well, she can't do that. Well, that's not true you just have to find out ways to do it in a smarter way. So like, I was expected to do everything. And then also when you're the small one, you get like shoved in holes or like, yeah. oh, she's light enough. She can walk up there and get that without breaking that. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So you, you know, I was an asset, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you're the one that goes into the cross spaces and oh, like yes. all the areas that shoved. nobody wants to go. Yeah. I got shoved everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Rubble is not not light. I just got done nope. with the renovation of like a, a home that's got a, a ton of kind of the same thing, just a ton of rubble that needed to go out to a dumpster. And it is like heavy, heavy stuff. Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how long did that last? And then what was your next step? And I, I wanted to hear too, like as you're working in this architectural firm that you guys are working on and you're looking at these architects, at that point, were you like, that's where I want to be? Or... Did you still feel like I want to be in the field? I want to learn more about actual construction processes and methods and understanding construction deeper? Yeah, uh, I definitely, I looked at the architects in there and I said, I don't want to do that. That looks miserable. I don't want to be sitting at that computer just staring at a screen all the time. So what I ended up doing, so I worked for that initial company for, I don't know, six or eight months or so. Um, and then got an offer from another general contractor that I'd been doing work for on the side. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, he hired me to work in the office. And basically, you know, it was 2005, 2006 that the economy was going completely crazy. Mm -hmm. There was so much work. And he basically offered me a job that was like assistant to the assistant, assistant copy person. <laughs> and I was like, sure. So... Because I wanted to work at a bigger construction company um, than just the one that was like four people. And yeah. while I really liked my time in the field, I wanted to know about how construction worked from a more experienced general contractor than the guys I was working for who were great, but I wanted like, so I transitioned to this other company and got a huge raise 
I was making more money than I ever, like, I was like $40,000 a year. Like this mm -hmm. is blowing my mind. This is so right. much money. This is amazing. Yeah. And I uh, started as the assistant to the assistant assistant, <laughs> did all kinds of drudge work. It sounds, like an, it sounds like an office episode, you know? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, yeah. They, they didn't give me a desk. They didn't give me a computer. They didn't give me anything. It was like hazing. So for four months, yeah. I just would show up and I was like, what am I supposed to do? And they were too busy to tell me anything. So I would just have to like figure out who needed help uh -huh. and how not to piss them off. Yeah. When I was being like, hi, can I help right. with something? Right. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of that. But sometimes they would give me these stacks of things that I would just have to copy on the copy machine. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is so demeaning. Then I realized that I should just read what I'm copying. Yeah. And I did. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is like 20 different electrical quotes. I bet this would be useful for me to understand mm -hmm. and like take back to my desk, which I had finally fished one out of the back room and like put it in the hallway so I could have somewhere to sit. Yeah. And then I would I would like analyze it myself. I was like, they're not going to give me anything to do. So then I organized the back room. I organized the closet, like the supply closets. And I just started like I just started by being at the supply closet, it was right outside the controller's office. So I heard every conversation for the two hours that I was like, I just try to be really strategic. Yeah, no, that <laughs> it reminds me of um, uh, Sean Sweeney's story a little bit. You know, he took a job as a yep. receptionist, you know, in, yep. in San Francisco and, you know, just same thing, like making yep. copies and yeah. just tried to learn as much as he could. In, yep. in the environment that he was in. It sounds like you did something similar, just like try to I soak did, it all yeah. in. Yeah. And then at one point, uh, the president of the company, who was a really wonderful mentor um, to me and taught me so much about construction and how to do it. He one day le leaned out of his office. He goes, Marilyn, come down here. I was like, OK, so I went to his office and he's like, all right, we're giving you a job. And I was like, what? Like yesterday I was organizing post-it notes. <laughs> he's like, right. we're giving you a job. We want you to project manage it. So wow. Uh, first, you're going to have to estimate it because we always train everyone as an estimator first. So you're going to get a crash course in estimating, which I'd already sort of been doing. I'd been yeah. helping with estimates. So, but he said, at this company, you estimate your own job, you own it. And if you don't have a good estimate and you don't make the company money, you're in trouble. I was right. like, okay, what? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so and he just What kind of jobs were you guys working on? Were you, was it multifamily stuff or what, what were you guys doing? It was all kinds of stuff. So I got assigned a single family house, which I think was a good idea to start me off with that. Mm -hmm. We had um, a pretty robust um, uh, arm doing a lot of medical and commercial buildings um, and fit out. Um, we did multifamily. We did high-end custom residential. Um, and we did sort of oddball commercial and industrial. Um, and we also, uh, the company had a development arm. So there was also development projects. And I got to be brought into a lot of those to sort of my boss caught it being eyes and ears, which at first I was like, what, you want me to take notes? Then I realized that the person taking notes is the one who literally learns everything. And sure. so right. I'd go to all these meetings. And so it was, it was a pretty wide array of stuff I got exposed to and got to participate in. So how did that first project as a project manager on that single family house go? I mean, what were some, <laughs> Antonia had a similar experience, like where she was just thrown out into the field as a, as yep. a PM and it was, it was a similar, very similar story again. And uh, like, what were some of the, I guess, takeaways, but also like mistakes that like, you know, looking back on things that were like, wow, that was a big, you know, big learning that I got from doing that single family home. Yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, first of all, my boss assured me, he's like, we're giving you a very experienced superintendent. So he's going to help train you in how to do this. And I was like, great. That's a good idea. I'm 22. Mm -hmm. What do I know about anything? Right. So uh, three weeks into the actual construction, that superintendent was pulled off to do another job. And I got someone who is not experienced and not enthusiastic about having me as the project manager. Mm -hmm. So that was a challenge. Um, the next thing that happened in this uh, sort of situation was that uh, I did not, because I was the lowest one in seniority, I did not get to pick my crews. Mm -hmm. So I got the dregs. So yeah. whoever was left over after every other project manager got like the star framers and the yeah. good guys I got who was left. And in those days, anyone who had a pulse could be hired at a construction company. Yeah. So my crew was, uh, 
it was pretty rough. So uh, I caught them. I I caught them cheating on their timesheets. Uh-huh. So uh, I figured it out. Figured out it was happening. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? So I went in and talked to my boss. I was like, what am I going to do? I was like, these guys are cheating on their timesheets. He's like, how do you know? I told him. He's like, sounds about right. Yeah. I said, what am I going to do? He's like, what do you mean? What are you going to what what are you going to do? He turned it right back around. Him. He's like, well, what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, sounds like it's a you problem. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty intense. So I had to go out and confront these guys. And, you know, when you're 23 and you're a woman on a job site. <laughs> That's tough. And, That's tough for anybody to to have that yeah. kind of confrontational uh, conversation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was also a few years ago. It was a different era, different place. Yeah. Um, and I had to handle it. And my boss was like, you're going to handle this and you're going to learn about it. And so what did you do? Did you fire podcast. them or did you end up <laughs> firing them or how did you, how did you handle um, it? I couldn't fire them um, because I wasn't, because there wasn't anyone else. So <laughs> right. um I was like, well, uh, guys, we're stuck with each other. Like, so I told him they, you know, were cheating and that was not cool. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like, what's their problem? Yeah. What's, what's, what's the deal? Like, this is unacceptable. Like in what world is it okay to steal from your employer, which is ultimately right. stealing from the person whose house you're building, like for right. this guy, this couple and their kids, like yeah. get out of here with that. Yeah. So I just, I, you know. I just, I was pretty tough, I guess. Yeah. And um, they, they stopped doing it. So I guess it worked. <laughs> were, were these it was, guys general laborers or were they, who were they? Were they, I'm just curious. They were like, laborers what, or, and yeah. carpenters and yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, by cheating on the, I mean, you know, you go out to the job site and you're like, all right, guys, like there's four pieces of plywood installed today. Like, ain't no way five of you for eight hours did that. Like, right. that's insane. Yeah. So that also taught me a lot about um, how to know what is an acceptable amount of work in a day, which sure. is an incredibly valuable thing mm-hmm. to have under my belt. So, yeah, because yeah. ultimately it's up to me to justify it, you know, whether it's a weather delay or they didn't have the right materials and it's my fault or they used all the wrong stuff because I didn't, you know, ultimately the buck stops with me, which is what my boss, I think, was trying to teach sure, me. Sure, sure. <laughs> So at what stage did you start rethinking going back to getting your master's in architect school? And talk to me about that transition, because it sounded like maybe early on you were like, "Ah, I don't know if that's the route I want to take. What made you change your mind to go back to school and and get a master's degree? So, uh, well, a couple of things. One, um, so I worked at that company for, I guess, three or four years or whatever, three years, four years, something. And uh basically the recession happened. So oh, right. 2008, 2009 hits and there was just not the same amount of work. Um, layoffs started to happen. I knew I wanted to go back to architecture school. Mm-hmm. It's not that I didn't want to be an architect. I just didn't want to be sitting at a computer do, picking up red lines day in and day out on some giant building with a team of 50. Like I yeah. just, I didn't want that. I wanted to be much more in the driver's seat I wanted to be much more in the nitty gritty of the project. So I always knew I wanted to be an architect. Um, So, yeah. So at that point I said, all right, well, this seems like a good time to go to grad school. So um, I applied and ended up choosing to stay at Virginia. So this whole time I I was in Charlottesville, Virginia Mm -hmm. and went back to UVA for my master's. One of the best financial decisions I've ever made in my entire life, frankly. Is going back to school? What was the decision? Is, is choosing to go back to UVA in state school tuition. Yeah. My tuition was like five grand a year. Wow, that's crazy. So I graduate with no debt. So that's amazing. Yeah. And you know, my other other front runner was I uh I had applied to Harvard and didn't get in. And I actually am quite grateful for that because it would have been three years. I would have been a hundred and seventy five thousand yeah. dollars in debt, you know. I, it would have, um, it really set myself up, uh, very, very powerfully for the rest of my, you know, starting my business, investing in real estate, not being saddled with that kind of debt made a huge difference. It's huge. It's huge. And didn't you actually go back to Harvard and you lectured there? Yes. So the first time I actually set foot in there was because I was an invited lecturer, which was pretty awesome. That's so awesome. That's (laughs) super cool. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. That's really cool. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about architect school and what, how long it took, what goes into it. We've got a lot of kind of, you know, beginning and intermediate investors or people just learning about real estate. Talk to us a, a little bit about that process um, and what it was like for you, just the experience of it. Yeah. So architecture school, um, becoming an architect is a quite a long process. Um, and it consists of three parts. You have to have a um, professional degree in architecture. So either a BARC, which is a special five-year program, or an MARC, which is a master's of architecture. If you go that route, it takes six to seven years to get all that education. Um, then you also need to intern for a certain amount of time. I don't think they call it interning anymore, but you have to do like, it was like 5,000 hours mm -hmm. in 18 different areas of experience that you have to work directly for a licensed architect to get those 5,000 hours. In my day, that was, it had to be after you were out of your master's program. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you have to take exams. And at the time I took it, it was seven exams. It's now six. It's the same material. They just condensed it. Yeah. Um, and when I took it, it was seven exams. Each exam is like three to four hours. Closed book. You know, yeah, right. it was on engineering, structures, um, you know, pra running a practice, uh, ethics, all kinds of stuff. And then um, if you failed a test, you had to wait six months to take it again. Mm. And you had five years to get all of them done. So that whole process, most people aren't. Get, it's a little bit faster now. They have some ways that you can go through it a little bit faster. Uh, but most people have no idea that it takes that long to get licensed. Um, it took me, I was 28, I think, or 29 when I was licensed. Mm -hmm. um, and I had been in the industry the entire time. Right, so right. it takes a long time. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, you're intense. It's really, like medical school, you know, for... Yeah. You know, it really is like the amount of time yep. and energy and effort that goes into it. It's, it's intense. Yep. Yeah. Um, so do you find in like your experience that there's a lot of people that think they want to be architects that put in the time, you know, it's, you hear the stories about a doctor that ends up like putting the time in, in medical, medical school and they finally get there and they're like, this is not for me at all. <laughs> do you find that much kind of attrition, like over the years with people that you maybe went to school with? How many of them like stick around and end up becoming practicing architects and stay in the industry? There's actually a lot of interesting statistics about this. I mean, for undergrad programs, it's very low because an undergrad degree in architecture is not a professional degree. Yeah. Um, mine was a BS, which meant that it was a more technical degree. But that, but with that, you can go do all sorts of other really interesting things. You can go into engineering, you can go into industrial design, you could go into real estate or construction or whatever. So a lot of people might be in like sort of allied industries, but they're not, they're not practicing architects. Mm -hmm. um, the, another close route is a lot of people practice as designers, but not as architects. They don't go through that whole thing. So mm -hmm. the, all the licensure stuff. Um, right. So there are plenty of people and firms are filled with people who are not licensed, um, but have still had um, significant training and have a ton of experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say that, you know, in grad school, for the most part, if you're in grad school to go for your professional degree in architecture, chances mm -hmm. are you do know that that is what you want to do because yeah. you've hopefully worked somewhere or have some experience. Um, it's not the easiest degree in the world, so <laughs> you don't want right. to go get it if uh, just for like the heck of it. So, yeah. Um, but at that same rate, there um, the gap between people who go through those different stages and who is licensed is pretty large. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there's a huge gap. It's only 20 to, I well, what is it? It's like 18 to 22% or whatever of practicing architects are women. So the attrition right. rate for women is way higher because yeah. all of this intense studying and all of this intense work and these exams and your internship hours are all taking place like in your mid twenties yeah. to mid thirties where Tough. women are yeah. potentially starting families and it's just a lot harder. Definitely. So there's still a huge gap. So architecture school has been 50, 50 men and women for a pretty long time. Mm -hmm. It was when I was in school and, but it's still, but the number of women architects is still right around 20%. Yeah. So. I think Antonia made the same point, something similar to that. Um, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened next after you, you finished your, your master's degree, you've got the licenses. Did you end up in Boston at that point? 
I did. Yeah. So in, um, turns out that if you go to a two year master's program, sometimes recessions last longer than two years. So I graduated into the recession. I was like, this was, I was, I thought I was tough. Um, yeah. So, uh, at my master's thesis defense, um, one of the people on my defense panel, um, was, a um, is an architect uh, with a firm in Boston and he offered me a job and I had, I had another opportunity in New Orleans as well. So I was trying to decide between New Orleans and Boston. Both of them were sort of like part-time ish jobs. Mm. They weren't like real jobs. So I had to decide which city to move to for like a half a job. Mm -hmm. Um, that's hard to do. I mean, I graduated without debt, but I didn't have any money. So I sold my car. I chose Boston um, and started working at Util, which um, at the time was like 17 or 18 people. Mm-hmm. Actually, I didn't even start there. I had to I had to wait a few months. I had to just be in Boston so that when he was like, I'm ready for you, I could go there. So I started teaching to help pay the bills a little bit um, at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, yeah, that's where I got um, all my multifamily experience was yeah. there because they're just multifamily um, powerhouses at that firm. So. so that lasted from what, 2000, when did you start? 2009, 10, eight, 10, 2010. 10, yeah. yeah. So um, things still hadn't bounced back quite at that no, point. No, and, but they were starting to. Yeah, definitely starting on, on the upswing. Um, so, so yeah, so that's 2010. Things were a little bit on the upswing at that point. How long were you at in Boston at that firm. And then did you know that you wanted to start your own firm at some point? Like, did you have those entrepreneurial inklings of, of wanting to do your own shop at some point? So I stayed there for, um, a couple of years. Um, and that's also when I did my, so I'd won a fellowship to travel around the world researching vernacular residential architecture. So I was doing these like trips in between trying to work and keep my job, which was a whole, that's a whole other story. Um, which I want to get into the whole traveling. Yeah, can, can you explain what vernacular architecture is? Cause I think there's a lot of people that may not know what that means. Uh, architecture, not done by architects. Yeah. So AKA 98% of the buildings in the world. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's what I was looking at. So uh, let's jump so, into that. I want to go there. So you, you got okay. a $50,000 grant, I think to travel the world studying vernacular architecture. Yeah. Talk to us about that. You did a longitudinal line, it sounded like, of travel, which absolutely sounds fascinating to me. Share with us some of like, you know, where you started, where, you know, like the, I just am absolutely, I love to travel. So I want to hear some, some of the adventures you had. I, I had a few adventures, let's just say. So, uh, yeah, so I did a line of longitude. Um, I had studied the summer the one of my grad school summers in Jamaica, I did a field school where I was training on historic masonry and carpentry techniques from Jamaican carpenters and masons. Mm -hmm. Um, And I spent the summer doing that and documenting uh, 18th century buildings in the small town in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So that was fascinating. I learned a ton. Um, And that's, I, we would be sitting on the beach there, you know, a bunch of us were in this program, be sitting on the beach and after work and one day i was like you know what i i sort of the idea kind of came to me of like why don't i uh, i thought i wanted to apply for this uh, fellowship um and i thought i i had discovered that my hometown and this place were on the same line of longitude and i was like that's interesting like they're tied together by this sort of arbitrary geographical thing that we made up Mm -hmm. but uh, I wonder what else is on that line. That, well, that was my thought on the beach. Like, what else is on that line? So I went back that and like got out a map, I guess. And there was an internet. So I like got out a map somewhere and like traced it around. And that became the basis of the trip. So I was in Peru. Um, and on the other side, I was in. Um, so I kind of like wiggled off my line because I was traveling with some folks. And so they had research to do in other places. So I got to go to other places as well. But I was in Beijing, I was in Mongolia, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Australia. That's awesome. And it how was long really was awesome. the trip? Uh, well, I broke it into different chunks. Oh, I also went to Switzerland as well as part of, which is not on the line of longitude. Right. But I was looking at the origin of the homes um, in my hometown. All mm-hmm. the immigrants came from Switzerland. So I went to that exact place in Switzerland where they were from. And I was looking at like, 
the architecture that they built then and then the architecture that they built uh, in my hometown to kind of compare yeah. and contrast. So that's um, super cool. The whole, yeah, the whole entire, I had to break it up into chunks because I was teaching and working and I, you know, $50,000 is a lot of money, but I didn't want to spend it on like rent. I wanted to spend it on traveling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I, uh, the whole thing was probably about six, five or six months of travel broken into chunks. My biggest chunk was about four months and the Asia trip was all one trip. So yeah. the biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. To break out of the treadmill of slaving away each week only to have nothing left over, watching the savings you have get eroded away by inflation's vicious bite, or freeing yourself from the corporate grind. It all requires you to master the conversion of time into value. To help you do this, we created a list of four simple steps to taking control of your personal finances and life. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. That's incredible. Um, I, um, it had to be life-changing. I've got to imagine it had to have been hard to come back to Boston. I would imagine like there had to be some reverse culture shock, like coming back and after like studying, cause you were in Mongolia, I know studying yurts or you, you pronounce them gur. How do you pronounce gur, them? Gur? That's a Mongolian word. Yeah. Gur. Okay. So that had to be a mind, um, you know, kind of mess with your mind a little bit to see how all these different people live and have for thousands of years. Talk to mm -hmm. us a little bit about the girl like that. Uh, I mean, like, I thought it was interesting what you said on Yona's interview, uh, just about how these structures have been around forever. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's a tendency, um, and I felt felt this way at times in my education, certainly feel it um, just as an American in the world that um, Western ideas are the first are like the first time anyone has thought about standardizing construction is a Western idea in the 20th century. That is a thousand percent not true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or the best masonry examples are like from the UK, from whatever. That that's I mean, there's gorgeous stuff there, but that's not right. true. There's many people around the world have amazing construction techniques and have wrestled with the exact things that that sort of when you go to school and learn about West, like a lot of Western when it's very Western centric, mm -hmm. then you you sort of think that no one else is doing this or no one else has thought of this. And it turns out everyone has because mm -hmm. everyone wants the same things out of a house. Turns out yeah. they all want to be, you know, dry from the rain or warm from the cold or, you yeah. know, cool from the heat or whatever. Like these are the things that everybody wants out of a house. So seeing how people solve those problems in ways like in Mongolia where they're using a GUR, which is basically the same, you know, if Genghis Khan showed up, he'd be like, yep, looks like a girl like i know what this is and they're all standardized parts and it works it works in the climate it works for lifestyle and you know they're good to go mm -hmm. then also seeing how some of these forms have translated over history so the shop house form which um is all over southeast asia it's all over the world frankly but like this particular form i was looking at um the southeast asian version um they're so shops on the first floor also yeah. up, up above, like yeah. pretty common all yep. over the world. Um, but the sort of the way it's laid out is there's this unique situation. So that gets translated into modern cities. That was an urban architectural type in the 17th century mm -hmm. in Vietnam or in Malaysia or wherever, wherever yeah. I was. Yeah. Those types are translated to modern types, modern shop houses, mm -hmm. um, which are fascinatingly impacted by early zoning laws, which they wouldn't have called them zoning, but uh, zo it was a combination of sort of zoning and tax law mm -hmm. that created the lot shape that created this, this type, this building type. Yeah. So you, when you have, when, when you're thinking about how zoning impacts our cities or how uh, governmental policy in the form of uh, real estate tax impacts mm -hmm. our built environment, Turns out these are things that people have been doing and thinking about for hundreds or even thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And and sort of seeing all how people have solved that or engaged with that 
in different places just makes my tool belt that much more yeah. uh, robust and also just sort of takes uh, takes my focus away from having everything be so Western centric. Yeah. Yeah. Is it something that you can apply then coming back here? Like some of the, the things and the learnings that you took away from that trip. Do you, is it tough to apply some of that stuff or are you able to do it? Um, I absolutely am able to do it, but there's an important distinction here. It's not about copying something. Mm -hmm. It's not about seeing a form and saying, uh, you know, wow, that's a really cool looking window. I'm going to paste that on, you know, yeah, a right. stick frame house in like suburbia. Like it's what it is. It's about understanding how people operate their houses or how people interact um, with the urban environment. Most of the places I was looking at were urban mm -hmm. um, and uh, finding new prototypes for, uh, you know, urban living or residential living or whatever you have to understand that these are deeply, um, these types are deeply culturally connected. Mm -hmm. So you can't just like take the, and th there's a lot of, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this that you, you sort of, you're like, well, I like the look of this. So now I'm going to take it and apply it like a paint bucket tool onto a building that over here. And then people wonder why it doesn't work. Right. Well, it's because you're not actually taking the function of it. You're just taking the look of it. You're, mm -hmm. you're not really understanding how it works either technically or culturally. Um, and so I think, I think it's a couple of things I it's construction technique for sure. I mean, I've seen so many things that, you know, I was just designing a porch recently for a project and I was like, Oh, right. Like there's this joinery technique that I saw in whatever, whatever, like, what if we just used a modified version of that, that would solve this problem. So like, sometimes that does happen, That's cool. but mostly it's about the, it's about the thinking behind it. That's most valuable. Yeah. So I wanted to jump back to you're, you're in Boston, you're at this firm, you've done this huge, amazing trip. Talk to us about getting Runcible Studios started. Explain how the name came about. Um, and just talk a, a little bit about making that jump from, I guess, like a W2 job to starting your own venture, which is a risky, you know, unnerving process for most people. I just wanted to hear more about that transition from working a W2 job to going out on your own, starting Runcible, Runcible Studios. I want to hear about mm -hmm. the, you know, derivation of the name and just that process, which is, like I said, scary and unnerving for most people. Yeah. So, um, so I had a little bit of a stopover in between. So I had about a year and a half after I left UTL that I was a design school administrator. So I was working at the Boston Architectural College at, in their practice department, directing a whole series of um, sections of the curriculum and also working on pairing groups of students um, for with local nonprofits to do design build projects. Cool. So we did a ton of them. Um, it was a really cool experience. Yeah. But I knew within a few weeks of starting the job that this wasn't for me. <laughs> like, Why is I, that? Explain that to me. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm not political enough to uh, be a higher ed administrator. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> yeah, I get it. Or I can't. I can. I can play one on TV, but I like. I just yeah. can't. I'm like a builder. I'm a doer. Like it's. It was too much. Like these meetings where everyone's talking mm. for like three hours, and then Ugh. everyone's like, "Wow, we got a lot of work done." I'm like, "We literally just did nothing." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just I missed being around people. You know, architects contractors, developers, people who, who are building things, who are like yeah. making stuff. Yeah. So I love teaching. I love curriculum building. I love a ton of the stuff I did, but I, I it was pretty clear it wasn't going to be the right thing. Mm -hmm. So, so combine that with like, um, you know, I don't want to go back and work for a firm. You know, I, I, I sort of chafed under not having enough like freedom to choose the projects I wanted to do or, or how I would do it. Yeah. Um, the, also, uh, salaries are just terrible. So I was like, I'm not even being paid a living wage. Um, in academia? You know, in, in architecture. No, academia in architecture. is way better. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have three more exams to pass. You know what? I'm just going to quit my job and academia. I'm going to keep all my teaching. So I negotiated keeping all my teaching. So I got paid for, for doing my courses. And then I had a, you know, I quit on my last day was uh, November 1st. 2013 was the last day I had a W2. So mm -hmm. that, uh, so I, but I didn't have a plan, uh, no plan. 
-hmm. I quit and I said, well, I got three weeks paid vacation. So, I'll, you know, that'll tie me over. It's good. Then it's going to be Christmas. Like, I don't know. I'll just pass my exams and then I'll, I'll like figure it out. Like I, I didn't, I did not have a plan. Mm -hmm. So people heard that I was kind of a free agent and somebody said, Hey, like, can you help on this project? Like just a few weeks of work, like, we'll just pay you whatever. I was like, sure. Mm -hmm. So word got around and I was doing some work for people here and there on the side, passed all my exams, became an official architect. Um, and then in April, the following year in 2014, I was like, you know what? I think I just accidentally started a business. Like, I, I think, I think that's what just happened. So yeah. I should probably get like a name. I should probably do an LLC. I should probably get some insurance. Mm -hmm. So I, I did all that and filed my LLC paperwork on April 15th. So it's very easy for me. My business yeah. birthday is also tax day. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I celebrate my business birthday every year on April 15th. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I had that about six months of like, so I did not do it in a traditional way. I didn't do it in like the super planned out, like, well, first I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that. And here's my strategic plan. Um, it was very organic. Yeah. Uh, and then I worked on my own. Once I decided to make a go of it, then I was like, all right, we're doing this. I got a seat at a co-working space for oh, cool. $300 a month, which felt like the most money I had, like I didn't have any money. Uh huh. Um, I got an additional roommate. I was like piling it in like every dime I could save, you know, how could I um, execute? So the name Runcible comes from the poem, The Owl and the Pussycat mm -hmm. by Edward Lear. Mm -hmm. And um, it describes a runcible spoon, um, which he doesn't really define, but most people like a spork. They think it's a yeah, spork. Yeah. With a sharp but, edge, um, right? It's kind of like everything all yeah, together right like here's i have one right here so one? like a spoon and a fork it's like one oh yeah you know yeah so this Very is cool. like one. that's a runcible but <laughs> yeah um so you know people say later i mean it was a nonsense word you know yeah. but basically it it using context clues you can say that it's a a word that describes an object that's both beautiful and utilitarian yeah so i was like that's cool that's a cool name and Very it was cool. the first book i ever read and I was oh like, really? Yeah, it sure. was your it was your yeah. very first book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's super so, impactful. Yeah. So uh, I also called it um, Studios with an S. So the company's called Runcible Studios, Studios with an S on the end, and that was because I already knew that I was going to be not only the Runcible Spoon, but the Swiss Army Knife. I wanted to be able to be nimble, and yeah. basically, Runcible Studios is a giant experiment, and me finding out money, finding out how to make money at doing things that I love, that I think are important, that are interesting, that fuel my curiosity, that are good for the community and all that good stuff. So I, I love that, it. I've done a lot of things under the Runcible Studios umbrella that are like not traditional architecture. <laughs> Can you talk about some of those? Because I'm, I'm curious about, I, I was checking out your website, which is really well done, by the way. I think you've spent you. a lot of time on it. I actually would like to talk a little bit more about that offline, but um, yeah. Talk to us a little bit about some of the unique projects that you've done that maybe be out, outside like the general scope of what most architects would do. Uh, well, you know, two of the biggest ones happened uh, right around the pandemic when everyone was getting creative about how to keep things going. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was uh, I opened up a store. So it's much smaller now because I sold a bunch of stuff and I didn't restart it. But I have a little store and I designed all this stuff and um you know, someone just placed an order yesterday. Like it's still going. It's just, you know, it's kind of bad there in the background. So I started a store. Um, my mom owned a store for many years. So I was raised in the retail environment and I love retail. I love it so much. So I loved like every part of it, like figuring out how to set up the store, figuring out how the logistics work. How do I do shipping? How do I keep track of stock? Like it was really fun. So I did that under Runcible's umbrella. Um, and as part of that, I also, during the pandemic, um, opened up a mask factory. So no I, uh, in the early days in Boston, it was, you know, the outbreak happened early there. So all of the hospital systems, no one had enough masks. So I, in like week two of the pandemic, I was making masks and like sending them places. So I like, just set up my I, I imagine like and... nicely designed masks, right? Not just yeah, generic yeah. blue ones. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I, I made, uh, I found a fabric store that would deliver because everywhere was closed. And so they would deliver and leave it on my front porch. And then 
I would make masks and I would give them away. And in those days, you know, nobody had anything. So I, my friends would text me and I would be like, yep, they're going to be on the front porch. I'll put your name on a sticky note. You can get it. Um, I designed the packaging. I designed, I came up with like a couple different versions, like these cool ones that you could put a filter in and all this kind of stuff. And, yeah. um, and then I sold them on the website and uh, that funded the uh, ones that I was making for healthcare workers in those early days when we, nobody knew what was going on. And um, I made them for organizations. Um, a developer actually hired me to make a whole bunch of matching ones for their whole team with their little logo on it. So I did nice. that. That's cool. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. So I would work all day trying to save my business during a pandemic. And yeah. I would sew. I was I was pulling, you know, 16 hour days working right. in the business and then sewing masks. Now, so I love it. I love the hustle <laughs> of the entrepreneurial spirit is great. Now, at that point, had, were you in Boston or were you back in Pennsylvania? Because you are kind of in between both places, from my understanding. Yeah, I'm in between both places. The between both places started as a result of the pandemic. So my all my family's in Pennsylvania. And after a year of not seeing all of them or seven months or whatever, yeah. I was like, so this is not yeah, this is not how I this is not it. This is not what I want. <laughs> Right. Uh, so I, um, the plan was always to move back to Pennsylvania. So what I did was, uh, I was going to open up a branch in Philly. So I got an apartment in Philly and I started networking and I started, um, you know, getting my ducks in a row and I'd have a Boston office and a Philly office. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was pretty, pretty straightforward to adding a city, whatever. Um, and that was going okay. But then very soon after that, I got the opportunity to renovate our family farm house. Yeah. So, uh, or the house on our family farm, which there's like three houses. Um, this is the oldest one that I renovated and that opportunity came up and I was like, well, we're close to Philly, but not that close. So maybe I will not do the Philly thing and do Boston and Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So, which is where now my other satellite location is. So you know, it's it's a moving uh, situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and trying to figure out, like, Boston and Philly, you can do the same thing in both places. There's subtleties and differences, and the cities are different or whatever. Sure. Lancaster and Boston are really are different. Are very different. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm navigating that. But, um, so you know. So share with us a little bit more about the family farmhouse. Your family were Mennonites from Switzerland. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Talk to us. Yep. They came to Pennsylvania and settled in mm -hmm. 17. You tell the story 17 or early 1700s. Yeah. Early uh, 1711. Um, they came over. So they were on the run in Europe for, I don't know, a hundred years or so um, being kicked out from various places. Cause no one liked the Mennonites. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so they arrived here uh, in 1711 and built the house that I'm in. Uh, that I renovated uh, in 1730. So, and they were farmers. Um, my nephew is the 10th generation to be born and raised here. Wow, so that's amazing. Um, yeah. So it's that's pretty so cool. cool. It's super yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've renovated this f farmhouse. It has been in the family for generations, right? I mean, yeah. talk that that's uh, incredible to me. I mean, talk to me, to us about the process when was it last renovated? Like what was, what's the experience been like? Cause it's, that's pretty wild. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, uh, so the house was, uh, built in 1730, renovated extensively in 1810, again in 1910 ish and again in 1950 and then pretty much not after that. So, oh. um, it was really rough. It had been abandoned for a while. Um, there were bats in the attic there were animals everywhere, groundhogs in the basement. Um, so when was, was the last time somebody had lived in the farmhouse? Uh, like 2012, I think. Okay, so it's been so, a while. Yeah. Um, and uh, my parents had done a bunch of really important work to it. They had repointed the whole exterior and done a bunch of work on the windows. So that was huge, huge. And, and it's a stone <laughs> um, structure, that, right? It's just stone. It's solid stone. Yeah. So 22 inch thick stone walls. That's awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. It's like a little castle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really cool. So 
Yeah. So then I, when I showed up, it was pretty much a blank slate. Um, Which had to be no, fun for you as an architect, like coming in with it was like really fun. Carte yeah. blanche. Yeah. It was, it was the toughest blank slate though that I've ever encountered because it's a blank slate from the standpoint that, yeah, I need to run all new electrical and plumbing and HVAC and all the systems, but it's a solid house. Like even the walls inside are solid. They're solid wood. That's how they built walls back in those days. They didn't use studs. They were just solid wall, like planks. Oh, really? So how do you run electrical when all the walls are solid? I was going to ask how this. Do you, <laughs> how do you run HVAC when there's literally logs holding the house up? Yeah. So it was a phenomenal challenge um, and one I embraced wholeheartedly. I love that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. So the fun is now when I tell people, you know, cause I've got heat and air conditioning, I've got ducts everywhere. I'm like, find me a duct, tell me where they are. They're really hidden. <laughs> so they're not so, visible. They're not exposed at all, huh? They're not exposed. They're definitely, if you, you can definitely see where they are, if yeah. you can read a building, sure. but, um, I, I, um, got pretty creative yeah. about how they're in here. So I worked with a mechanical engineer to size the ducts really carefully. Um, I have a fresh air system and an ERV in here. So I had to run all those ducts as well. Um, and then I also had, um, I built a model of the house um, and mapped out every single duct, every single plumbing line, everything. Wow. So that when I was working with the contractor and with the subcontractors, I was like, we are not cutting through anything. We are not destroying these walls. Yeah. And and they were all game, right? Like if they're on this project, they're going to be into it, you know? So, so they were into it. Um, but uh, there's a lot of, um, not many architects do that. We do it for actually all of our projects. We design all the duct work um, and it makes a huge difference I bet. because what the subs will push you into doing yeah. is nowhere near as sharp and clean as what you can do if you really, if you really dial it in. So. You had a post on Twitter, a thread that all about HVAC systems, which was like, maybe it was in your newsletter. I can't remember, but super in depth and like a standalone lesson on HVAC systems. Yeah, I'm definitely an HVAC nerd. I think I've been looking into um, different HVAC certifications and things because I would love to. I'm not going to become a mechanical engineer. I don't have six more years of education that I right. want to get, but right. uh, I'd love to. I'm like a closet mechanical engineer. <laughs> yeah, right. That's cool. So is this something with the farmhouse? Is it completed or are you still work? Is it like a work in progress? I mean, is a farmhouse ever stuff. complete? Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So definitely not complete. I mean, I, I it's eminently livable. The bathrooms yeah. are all like it's to for all intents and purposes and you can see it on my website it's you know it's complete but yeah i you know always will be a work in progress there's always things my roof just failed so i'm getting um, that repaired <laughs> yeah like fun. a new roof so yeah um you know and that's that's part of the challenge of running the business is that i don't have the same uh sort of cash situation that a lot of people might have like this house is not an investment Right. You know, so I you're not going to Airbnb it or anything like that. Like no, the other my structure. Home. And yeah, right. No, and I'm not going to sell it. Right. So right. there's no, I mean, did I add a metric ton of value here? Sure. Yes. Yeah. But it's not value that I can realize. Right. Yeah. So it's not going to leave the family. Right. You're not going to. No. Yeah. No. So that's, it's kind of a, and, and to have that as a financial responsibility, the farm and all the buildings and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's family, it's not just me, but, yeah. um, but it's still a real responsibility. And I, I, it impacts how I think about how I run my business mm -hmm. and how I invest in other things, you know, cause Which I, I want to get them. into your investments. You know, there's yeah. a, mostly real estate investors, you know, for our podcast, talk to us a little bit about some of your early investments that you've done. I know on your on your pinned uh, Twitter thread, it said it looked like you were looking for your next, you know, real estate investment project. Talk to us a little bit. Let's start with the first one that you did and just kind of like what your thought process is in terms of what you're interested in pursuing, you know, going forward. Yeah. So, I mean, like many people, my first one was uh, or I felt I don't know many people. I don't know. I fell into it is the short version. So. I bought a condo in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia when I was living down there, when I was contracting and all that kind of stuff. 
And I bought in, you know, what, 2006? Mm -hmm. Great. Great time to buy a condo. That's right. great. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think interest only 7.5%, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Like, right. What did I know? Yeah. I didn't know anything. Seemed like a good so, idea. <laughs> yeah, this is what everyone is doing, right? Like, this is what you're supposed to do. So, like, I'll just refinance later. Like, no yeah. biggie. So, um, so I had that. And then, you know, uh, by the time I was ready to move to Boston, I couldn't sell it. You know, it was recession. Yeah. No one was going to buy it for what I paid for it. So I was like, well, I guess I'll just have, uh, I'll just rent it out to uh, my, my friends who are finishing out grad school. Fine. So I did that. Then um, eventually ran out of people I knew to rent to. So I was like, well, I guess I have to figure out how to rent to people I don't know. And by the way, I'm in Boston still. So I have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And maintenance stuff comes up. But luckily, I was a contractor. So I know tons of people who can fix stuff for me in town. So I cobbled it together. And pretty soon I was like running an out of state property as a landlord yeah. in a condo with a homeowners association that I had to like keep happy and all that. So I was like, I got, I can do this. Like, this yeah. is fine. So I said, but you know what? I really want to own a place in Boston. Um, the problem is that I was saving up my nickels and dimes, but there was no way I was ever going to buy any, be able to buy anything that cost. I just didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. So I would have had to sell the place, which I still couldn't sell yet. So I said, okay, well, where could I buy something with my pile of nickels and dimes? Mm -hmm. Well, my hometown. So I bought a two family in Lancaster sight unseen, um, which, you know, now Just I a, can do that, but <laughs> what'd you do like a zoom call or what, how did a you zoom call? Yeah. How so, did you even find out about the property? Um, so, uh, the realtor that I work with, um, he's been a family friend for a really long time. So I trust okay. him and I, yeah. he knows at this point, he knows I'm going to look at something later with him today, actually. Um, oh, nice. Uh, so he knew what I was looking for and he's like this and he knew the neighborhood. He's like, this is a great neighborhood. This was before I knew anything about any of that stuff, but I was like, yeah, yeah it is a good neighborhood. Like, um, and you know, so, uh, but I learned a few things. I have now a list as a good investor should of things right. that like if the property <laughs> doesn't have these things, I'm probably going to pass. Like <laughs> if it has like three of these things, I'm definitely not, I'm definitely not. There. So talk anyway, it was a, say it was a duplex. Was it a, yeah, it's a it's a two family. So it was a single family that was converted. Actually, it was a old hair salon with an apartment above that mm -hmm. someone made the hair salon into an apartment. So it's okay. like kind of it's definitely a weirdo building. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So what are um, some of the top two or three things you would avoid in the future? Like oh that maybe my gosh. So, you. Yeah. Um. One of them is do not like I need to have access to the utilities without going through a tenant space. Yeah. So um, I learned that uh, the hard way because uh -huh. that building doesn't have that. And I have to check with the tenant and the tenant gets annoyed and I don't want to annoy tenants. Right. Like sure. I don't, I don't want that in my house. People trucking through all the time. So, yeah. um, and then uh, other things like, um, you know, just knowing that no matter what state the furnace is in, no matter what, no matter if it's brand new or 30 years old, I will have to replace it. Like yeah. it will fail. I will have to deal with it. Like, I don't know whether I just have like bad furnace bad luck or furnace what, luck. Yeah. but like I just, so now I just factor that in. I'm like, uh -huh. okay, Gonna need I mean, I'm being a little bit silly, but not, you know? Um, right. And then, you know, some other things, uh, that I, um, that are big pain is, uh, this property has nowhere for the trash cans to sit. And the city has certain regulations about where trash cans can and can't be. Mm -hmm. And I basically can't follow those regulations because of the way the building is laid out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly having to deal with all of that, like annoyance where the city's like, you need to do this. And I'm like, I literally can't. Right. And then I'm like, I can't ask my tenants to keep the rolly trash cans like in their <laughs> house. Like I can't. So stuff like that, it's like little stuff, but it's that stuff that like, Every two or three months, there's like a little thing I have to deal with because the trash is on the street, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's another one. <laughs> yeah. Just little festering problems that yes. you just don't want to deal with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're not that fun. Um, so what's next? Like what, what are your, you said you're going to go look at a place today. What's uh, kind of next on your agenda? Yeah. So I did eventually sell my condo, um, learned about 1031s, 
Oh, good. I had no idea. Yeah, I had no idea what that was, but someone so was real like, quick, you should kind of explain a, a quick for people that don't know what a 1031 is. So a 1031, which I learned about on the fly, is yeah. when you sell a property and you put you have to give the money to someone else. You can't touch it. Put it in an escrow account. A lawyer or somebody holds it. And then uh, you can you don't get taxed on it. Yeah. You then take that money and buy a like property. So you can't sell your condo and then buy, you know, a vacation home or whatever. Yeah. Those are the rules. So you did Do the 1031 on the con on the condo? On the condo. Or? Okay. Yeah. On so the condo. You so you've got this money in escrow, is that right? That is now ready to be, you've got what, 180 mm -hmm. days to no, buy something? No, so I, that was years ago. So oh, I already, already bought did two properties with that. Yeah, so okay. I 1031 that into another two family and a single family, which I renovated and sold. So, got it, oh cool. Um, and now the coffers have built back up. So that was right, that was right at the beginning of COVID. Like I sold that single family. I was like, oh, I better sell this. I was thinking of selling it. I should do this now before things get crazy in COVID. So of course I missed the biggest run up in like the history of. Yeah. You know, that so. timing is hard to. Yeah. I just, I like, I don't, Zillow still sends me those little updates. Like this is your property. And I'm like, I don't want to know. Like, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That's a nice reminder. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So I um, have, you know, was able to carve out. Um, but you still did savings. well, right? Just not as well yeah. as you could have. I I, I did you... fine. Yeah. I didn't do, I did just fine. Mm -hmm. And the amount of learning that I had uh, on it was, um, you know, it's like getting paid to learn if you do it right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's how I view it. Um, and so you were your own GC, I presume, right? You managed the whole project and. I did manage the whole project, but I, it was during, it was like right, I guess it was be right before COVID. And I, I sort of managed it with a team. So I was still in Boston. So I was managing oh. this from afar. I bought that sight unseen, ran the entire job sight unseen. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, the, people shouldn't do that. No, that's rough. They should not do that. Yeah. So I did it because my cousin's a general contractor and he was on the job. I can trust him. Yeah. It was a straightforward project, more or less. Yeah. And I have a lot of experience. So I right. know what I'm, I know. I knew the decisions I needed to make. And if someone's like, we just opened up this wall and found X, Y, and Z. I'm like, that's my day job. So I'm like, do A, B, and C. Exactly. I'm fine. Right, right. So, but if you're not seasoned, well, you shouldn't do it anyway, but if you're not seasoned, you really <laughs> shouldn't do it. So you're not going to do that again? Uh, no. Something out of state no. and manage yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, now that I'm, I'm uh, more focused in Lancaster, I can check on my properties more often. I can, yeah. you know, I can go see stuff. Yeah, I highly recommend going to see things in person that you're planning to buy. Yeah, highly I don't get the whole that. out of state. You know, it's like a thing, but I don't get it. Like, I want to see my what I own. But yeah, I do too. And I think it's I think it's responsible. You yeah. know, like when things go wrong, you know, and I self manage my properties, which I know is like a whole other topic uh, that people have strong opinions on in both directions. Sure. Um, but I self manage. No one does it as well as I do. Yeah, and nobody will. Nobody will. I yeah. tried management. It didn't work nah. at all. I had angry tenants and a whole bunch of mess and whatever. Not saying I won't do it in the future, Yeah. but probably that'll be an arm of Rensible Studios, right? Property management. Yeah. Who knows, right? <laughs> who knows? You're nimble. Like you can, yeah, yeah. it definitely sounds like, uh, I don't know. It's like a whole, me I mean, I don't, I don't, it's a whole Mennonite thing in a way, like super entrepreneurial. And uh, I've always admired that. I live in Ohio and there's like a, you know, big Amish community here and they're just like very admirable people, I think. So yeah, I mean, it's got to be I, in I your think, DNA. I think so. I also, I just, both, both my branches of my family are very entrepreneurial. And yeah. I recently learned actually that my grandmother um, owned real estate on her own Oh wow! In Lancaster, like back in the day, like in the '30s, I was wow. like, That's she rare. she bought it on her own <laughs> yeah. as a young single woman, and you know, wow. and and like worked outside the home, did all this stuff, and she was moving and shaking in the '30s, and all my other grandmothers did really cool stuff. So I think it's I think it was inevitable that I would do all sorts of business things. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I wanted to ask real quick on like on the property. Do you? you know, you had your experience in Mongolia. Are you going to build any kind of alternative structures on the, uh, at, you know, on the farm or is that, that not part of the plan? 
So yes, it's definitely part of the plan. So I want to um, build some experiments. I have a few ideas for experiments. I want to do things like um, using straw that we create here on the property to build yeah. a small building so Sweet. that to, I want to try to um, build something that is like the houses that are here. These stones for this house, the logs for this house, we're all within yards of where the house is. So what would be the modern equivalent? How could I do that? Mm -hmm. um, there's a brick house, a log house, and a stone house. So I'll make the straw house. We're going to keep the three little pigs kind of going. Yeah, right. So I want to make a straw building with straw that we create here on the farm. Um, I have, uh, I've been really getting into um, learning more about um, gardening and farming. Yeah. So um, I've got a whole bunch of ideas about um, different regenerative processes that, um, whether it's for the land or also for buildings and greenhouses that, um, you know, use um, earth cooling and warming and this kind of stuff. So basically, yeah, I just, um, I would love to do a whole series of experiments um, here on the land and see, see what happens. So and yeah, the nice thing about your, your situation is like, you've got the canvas to do that. It sounds like you've, you're really fortunate in a lot of ways to be able to have the, the land, to have the structures and to do these experiments, which uh, yeah, fun stuff. Yeah, for sure. That book, that book that I had mentioned earlier before we started called uh, Design Outlaws on the Ecological Frontier. It's got all kinds of stuff like that, like straw bale construction and earth ships and geodesic domes and all kinds of, you know, stuff that's pretty alternative, but very cool. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be learned from it. You know, I want to try to figure out how to do um, composting toilets and all this kind of stuff yeah. in a way that isn't like stinky and gross, yeah, right? Exactly. Like I want to do that for like people like sort of normal people who are not sort yeah. of into these things or who are like, ew, I don't want that. Or I'm not interested in alternative stuff or yeah. that's, you know, too hippy dippy for me or whatever. And I'm like, no, actually this makes a lot of financial sense as well. Yeah. I'm looking at renovating one of our barns into a potential Airbnb or yeah. guest house or something. And in order to do that, I would need to put in a septic field, which mm -hmm. would mean taking you know, Expensive. a quarter of an acre. Yeah. Taking a quarter of an acre out of cultivation. And it would have to be like a six foot tall sand mound because the soil doesn't park around here because it's so, it's so wet. And it would be, you know, a hundred to $200,000 by the time I'm all yeah. done with it. Yeah. What if I got a composting toilet or that, that actually works and is cool and isn't stinky and doesn't look stupid. Yeah. Or designed one or figured out one. That I mean, that's a financial thing. It's not just like good for the land and the earth. It is that. And also it will be the thing that makes the project pencil, right? Yeah. There's a this is totally random, but there's one called the Clivus Multrum, which I just love the name. <laughs> it's called the Clivus Multrum, and it's just like uh exactly what you need for the uh, you know, so you don't have to build a septic system. It's um, yeah. Yeah, I've kind of gone down that rabbit hole myself. So it's fun, fun stuff. Totally. Um We've kind of, we're approaching like a little past an hour here. Do you have time for a quick uh, fire round? Yeah, sure. Cool. So uh, I know you're a huge reader and I wanted to hear what book you think I should read. Like what's been a super impactful book in the last year or so, maybe over COVID that you read that really made a big impact on your life? Uh, wow. Um, I usually like to have more time to think about a question like that because I always blank when someone asks me that. Um, so, I mean, I read a lot of things that are not related to business or architecture, and that yeah. is on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, I read a lot of things. Um, I've been on, like I mentioned, I'm reading a ton of, right now about organic farming and yeah. um, small scale organic farming right now. I mean, I've read like 20 books in the last 10 days. So like that kind of stuff. But I was also on a pretty big um, and had been on a pretty big kick reading books about um, 1960s Apollo program and Gemini program and all that kind of stuff. So space race stuff. Uh -huh. um, I think that some of that stuff to me is so fascinating because it's describing a fascinating decade in American history where we said, uh, well, we haven't even sent, we just sort of sent someone up you know, Alan Shepard, like up and, you know, for 15 minutes and he landed and like, that was it. And then Kennedy says, uh, PS, we're going to send someone to the moon and bring him back safely. Mm -hmm. And then that, that became like a thing that everyone 
put on a piece of paper and posted above their desk at NASA. And like 400,000 people worked on that program at, at its height. Yeah, and it's I crazy. think the, the number of lessons that I've learned about management, communication, um, tracking progress, uh, you, you can't mess up in space. Like you can't, you can mess up in construction all the time, but mm -hmm. you cannot mess up in space. Yep. You, it's, there's no room for error. So how do you, so, so reading a series of these books actually where they're, they're talking through exactly how they made this happen. I mean, it's fun to read about the astronauts and like they're cool guys and like that's yeah. really fun and right. the stories, but actually the nuts and bolts of how they made a project like this happen mm -hmm. and brought all of those people together to actually make it hundreds of subcontractors. Yeah. You know, this is the person who made the spacesuit. This is the person who made the valves on the thing that connects the other thing. How did they orchestrate that yeah. in the 60s with no email? And, you know, it's so sort of management, communication, quality control, creativity, engineering. It's been profoundly impactful to me to read that kind of stuff. Um, and, and manifesting a vision, you know, like John F. Kennedy, that's you right. know, like that, like it's fascinating. Yeah. Yep. So much that goes yeah. into it. Were you into science fiction, like as a you know younger kid? Not really science fiction that much. No. Um, but uh, I've always loved sort of the space program and that kind of stuff. Um, one of my one of my many nerdy interests. See, yeah. there's my Saturn V in the background. Do you see him? <laughs> or, oh yeah, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Not, yeah, very so, cool. A Love scale it. model. Yep, that's very cool. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I mean, some of the, the great books there, you know, um, uh, Andrew Chaikin wrote an amazing book about just uh, that's what I would start with if people are interested in learning more about how. How it do all you spell his last name? C, C H A I K I N, I believe. Um, and he wrote a book that summarize that goes through the Apollo program and just kind of describes how it happened. It's it's very readable. Okay. And then my other favorite space book um, that. It is um, Mike Collins' book, Carrying the Fire. So he oh, yeah. was the command module pilot on Apollo 11. So he famously got the closest to the moon, but like didn't get to, you know, right. you know Buzz and Neil are like down on the yeah. moon and he has to circle above. Um, so he, he's a fantastic writer. He's a okay. really, really good writer. He's funny and engaging and um, not all the, I've read a lot of the astronauts books and they're they're like engineers and test pilots, uh -huh. but Mike Collins is a real writer. So I'll put so anyway, this, those are those are two good ones. I'll put it in the show notes. Cool. So <laughs> next one, you've done a ton of traveling. Where is one place our listeners you would say they've got to go? Oh my gosh, which is uh, a hard question, but like on your on your journey, what was one place that was like I really want to get back there? Um. Basically, uh, so I would say that it's not the most, it's not the best metric to say, where would I want to go back? Mm -hmm. Because some of the places I went, I would never want to go back. It was very <laughs> difficult to travel there, yeah. but I am so glad I did. Like mm -hmm. being in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that was really rough. Like that was on another trip. That, that was yeah. really rough. That was, I wouldn't, I, I don't particularly have an interest in repeating, you know, that experience, you yeah. know, getting in a knife fight, like, yeah, whatever, like R losing all my bags, yeah. walking across the border on foot. But that experience, putting yourself in a position within bounds where you are deeply uncomfortable. Yeah. That it's the difference between traveling and vacationing, right? That's not a vacation. No, that's <laughs> that, not. That's like, I don't even know if that's traveling. <laughs> like there's, there's another word for it, but there's that's a like bit a little bit of surviving. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that trip, you know, was absolutely life changing. I mean, just life changing. Um, and then you, you know, I was in um, Tanzania, Rwanda, and the Congo, and I had friends in Rwanda who I was staying with, and you know, experiencing things from the standpoint of people who live somewhere, I think is really, really great. So whatever you can do to go somewhere and either stay with someone who lives there or get connected to people who are actually living there, then you get to see a side of the place. Um, and that goes for places that are easy to travel. I mean, I've been to Italy like seven times. I studied there a bunch of times. Yeah. 
and I'm going back this October, like Italy is so easy to travel and it's so fun. Mm -hmm. It's so great. Um, and so I've been back there the most number of times. Um, but I also, some of the places that I've been, I don't, wouldn't choose to go back, but I'm so, so, so glad that I went. Yeah. That's awesome. Great adventures that you've had. I really have <laughs> loved hearing about it. Um, for our listeners that want to reach out to you, learn more about you, we didn't mention your newsletter. I wanted to ask, ask about that a little bit. Can you talk real quickly about the, the newsletter, if you would? Yeah, so um, it's called Building Knowledge, and it's on Substack. Um, and uh, I just try to collect uh, in longer form a lot of the thoughts that I have. Um, some of it comes from Twitter feeds that I expand on, or that I have a list of topics that I'm just working through. Or sometimes people will ask me, hey, can you write about X and Y, or I have a question about this or that. And the idea is it covers all parts of um, what I know about building. So, you know, for an audience of people who want to build or who are building, and that could be owners, developers, contractors, architects, people who are interested in all this kind of stuff. I try to keep the content more intro level mm -hmm. because I think that there's a lot of people who, especially in real estate, who don't have a lot of construction experience. Yeah. And it's sort of become one of my uh, recent passions in the last year or two to help developers understand um, more about construction. Well, I saw you post something about that, like maybe offering a course on that to developers, real estate people that, you know, don't have the basic construction knowledge that, I mean, I think you kind of need, <laughs> frankly, yeah. but yes. a lot of people don't have it. So is that something that's in the works? Yeah. So, I mean, I already do consulting with developers where I work with them one-on-one -on -one, uh -huh. um, to help them through processes like this. Um, but yeah, I'm looking into... Uh, probably more like a seminar and less of like a course. Okay. Um, I mean, I've taught many courses over my time of being an adjunct professor, but none of them would sort of easily translate to what developers might want to know. So it'd be quite a lot of work to make like a full course. So I'd probably, uh, probably interested in doing more like seminars and keeping it more, uh, keeping it a little looser. So, yeah. Um, but yes, I would love to do that. Cool. I definitely want to find out more about that. Um, how I wanted to hear how has Twitter impacted your career, your life? Like how, what's your experience been with it? So Twitter, um, it's sort of changed my life, honestly. Yeah. Like I, it's, I know so many interesting people and I've learned so much mm -hmm. from everyone on Twitter. I, it's just, it's kind of blowing my mind how, yeah. uh, the connections that I've made and the, the people that I, uh, that I know and get and can, can, get their counsel on certain things or be inspired by their work. Um, and I, I like, you know, there aren't too many architects on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. and I like being at the table where decisions are getting made, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, or, or among people where decisions are getting made, um, you know, developers. So yeah. I like participating in those conversations. So yeah, I've gotten plenty of work off Twitter. Um, you know, uh, some wonderful friends, business relationships, all kinds of things. Yeah. Well, you're, you've been an important voice on there. I mean, I really think you've contributed a ton to the community. I tell every young person, and I don't know that people really understand it. Like you've got to get on real estate Twitter, like, like really like go do it right, <laughs> right now. Like yeah, it's such yeah, a wealth sure. of information that it's like huge. Well, and I also think it gives me a chance to dispel a lot of the myths about what architects do. Yeah. And what, why they're important to the process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also very important uh, to me personally, but also to our industry. There's yeah. a sense that developers and architects butt heads or contractors and architects butt heads or developers and contractors butt heads. And the reality is that, sure, that happens. Yeah. It's a tough industry. Yeah. But when we understand more about what everybody has to do and what the problems are that they're facing and the challenges then we can work together to make buildings. That's why we're all there. Yeah. Like that's, we're there to make buildings together. So we should understand each other's role and support each other to make it happen. Yeah. So talking about Twitter, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Is it through Twitter or are there other ways? Talk to us about a couple of ways people can find out more about you. Yeah, so Twitter is the easiest. Um, so at MW Modinger and you can DM. I mean, DMs are open. You know, yeah. I try to answer as many as I can. Um, you answered and, mine. Uh, yeah, that's true. I did. <laughs> Here I am. Right. Um, 
And uh, my business uh, through my website is runciblestudios.com. Um, if you fill out a form there, um, it goes right to my inbox. So it's it's me usually yeah. answering. That's cool. Um, you can learn all about our services and what we do. And um, and then also our Instagram, which is at Runcible Studios. I, c- I just can't get it to grow like Twitter. So uh, I'm always looking for people to follow me there too. That's You've, where all the pretty pictures are. <laughs> yeah, right. You've got, what, at least 20,000 followers on Twitter, right? Almost. It's like 19.8. Oh, yeah. let's get, well, hopefully this episode will push you over the yeah, edge. Yeah, give me a few more. <laughs> yeah. Marilyn, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks for uh, spending some time with us today. Yeah, of course. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. We did our first Oklahoma deal we, that we bought in September of 2020. We just sold last October 2022. Um, hit like a 60% IR, which is insane. Wow. And then we was able to 1031 that money into a property that was 30 years newer so it was just like a win-win all around and i had 1031 into that property sold that property and then deferred the gain again and then another 1031 so i've done like i have two instances now that i've done two two 1031s with the same original cash 